It doesn't matter. I'll tell you, you know, the devil, ain't a, he ain't afraid to tell you how it is. He's not afraid to lay it out to you, buddy. I've been laid out. I've had the devil lay it out to me now. Don't you think he hasn't? And I know you have too. He's not bashful. We shouldn't be bashful about the things of God. Hallelujah. And our salvation and our walk with the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I don't want to do one thing on my own. Put me where you want me, Lord, that's where I belong. Give me the strength to do thy perfect will. So when I'm in the lowest valley, I can climb the highest hill. Oh, Lord, I want to be what you want me to be Lord I want to do the things you want me to do Lord let me stay in the center of thy will for when I'm in the lowest valley I can climb the highest still This world gets more wicked every day. People's hearts have grown cold. They've forgotten how to pray. But if I live to be a hundred, I'll keep holding to your hand. Till you come and take me home to that promised land and Lord I want to be what you want me to be and Lord I want to do what you want me to do and Lord let me stay in the center of thy will so when I'm in the lowest valley, I can climb the highest hill. And Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. And Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. Oh Lord, let me stay in the center of thy will. But when I'm in the lowest valley, I can climb the highest hill. So when I'm in the lowest valley, I can climb the highest hill. The Lord is good. I'll be speaking out of the King James Version here tonight. If you'd like to stand just for the reading of the word, I'll try to move this right along. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Now this is our Lord Jesus speaking here. 
This is Jesus speaking. And he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore by their fruits you shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say, now this is Jesus speaking. Now he knows what's going to happen, doesn't he? He knows what's going to be on that great day of judgment. He says again, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And Jesus says, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work Iniquity. Iniquity is the King James Version word of sin. Let's just finish it. Just finish it out here. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, this is Jesus speaking, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain did sit in, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Verse 14, maybe we just, we, we just uh, repeat this verse here. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Few there be that find it. And I'd like to speak tonight, maybe I could title this, this, this message here tonight, a short title, The Chosen Few. The Chosen Few. Can we all pray? Hallelujah. Blessed Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful church. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the grace you've given me, Lord, to come back and speak behind us, this holy pulpit, one more time. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the sweet Holy Ghost, the sweet spirit that I feel all over me right now. I thank you, Lord, for the sweet spirit, Lord, that these, these dear brothers and sisters of mine throughout this house feel right now in their hearts and their souls. And I pray, Lord, would you anoint this message, anoint us, anoint our hearts and our minds and our, and, and our, our eyes to be open to the truth of your wonderful word. And we ask it all in the name of our wonderful Lord Jesus. And everybody said, thank you for standing for the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. I'm speaking tonight. Oh, I'd like to say again, I'd like to thank again Brother Mackey. He did a wonderful job um, while we was gone. And I tell you, it, it's good to have good brothers like that that can stand in and, and, uh, and, and uh, well, how does the Bible say it? Uh, fill in the gap. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's a right smart gap with me now. But uh, anyways, God is good. Thank you, brother. I tell you, I really appreciate that. But I'm speaking tonight on the title, 
the chosen few, the chosen few. You know, it's an awesome responsibility to be a pastor nowadays. Well, any day. It's an awesome responsibility being a pastor of a church. And I tell you, since I've been pastoring this church body, I have such a greater appreciation for pastors that sacrifice their time. And I know we'll be on the Internet. I just want to say I have a greater appreciate, appreciation for every one, last one of them. I'm telling you, I do. For spreading this gospel of Jesus Christ and praying and, and searching out these scriptures and these under shepherds, the Bible calls them, that are feeding God's children. I have, Brother Jerry, I tell you, I've had a greater appreciation for him here in these last three years. God's good. Me and my family, we were traveling on vacation these last two weeks, and uh, I saw this church sign that, that read. Now, this was on a church. I ain't going to tell you what denomination it was just by the, the title. But it said, and I wrote it down, it says, which is, we're not, it says, now, this is what they put on the sign. I like reading them signs, Brother Sheeds. It's, it's some, good, some good stuff on it. I like that one that said, it says, uh, God is moving, come and see. <laughs> I thought, now, you know, the guy that down the road that don't know nothing about the Lord, he thinks God's moving from that church. <laughs> I've laughed, I laughed and laughed. But anyways, I know what they were saying, what they were meaning. But uh, this sign, it said, it says, uh, it says, we're not here to please you. We are here to please God. I'm like, whoa, ho, ho, that's putting a little fizz where the trouble is, isn't it? I tell you, that's a pretty strong word. I wonder what sister so-and-so in that church thought of that when the pastor put that on the side. That's some pretty gutsy words, isn't it? We're not here to please you. We're here to please God. Now, that's the truth, isn't it? That's the way it used to be. Many of us in our American churches today have been brought up in some kind of church environment. We have. Maybe daddy was a preacher. Maybe granddaddy was a preacher. Maybe uh, grandmother or mama was a piano player or an organ player or, or somebody in your family played instruments in a church house. Maybe somebody was a Sunday school teacher in your home or maybe you even was. We've had relatives that that, that have played the music, that have been on boards, have been on, thank God for them. Hallelujah. You know, back in the good old days, you ever say that? Hey, I'm in that, I'm in that, that, that bunch now, Brother Charlie Brown. I can say that now that I'm over 30. Back in the good old days, now I had shoes when I was a kid. In Chicago, we had shoes. I know you all didn't around here, right? Richard, you all have shoes? Oh, you did have them? Yeah, take them off, I tell you. But back in the good old days, if you heard that, I tell you, I like, you know, it feels good when I say that. Back in the good old days. Back in the good old days, you know, it wasn't a question when you asked someone if you went to church. I don't know if you can remember this far back. It was really a matter of where do you go to church? Do you remember back then? Everybody went to church. Or they had some sort of, or they would drug to church as a child. And, uh, but everybody, I mean, you didn't ask, it wasn't a deal where you just asked anybody, hey, do you go to church? It was really, where do you go to church? Even in Chicago, we was like that. They, I mean, everybody around us, they attended some sort of church. There was a lot of Catholics, a lot of uh, Episcopals out to where we're at. Where we where we was, not where we're at, but where we was in Chicago, and uh, but it was pretty much a given that everyone had went to church or claimed a church, so to speak. I guess you could say it might be better said. Thank God for our heritage. All good, isn't it? Hallelujah, good. You know they taught us back then in the good old days to respect the house of the Lord. You know we didn't come dressed any old way. You know they made us put her shoes on to go to the house of the Lord to wear our Sunday best, Brother Atkins. You know, we didn't cut a shine. That's a country word, isn't it? Cut a shine in the house of God. We had to brush our teeth if we had them. <laughs> I'm getting there. 
But, uh, you know, we were taught to respect people back then. Now, that was a long time ago, isn't it? Respect the house of God. Respect the preacher, the guy, the man or the lady that's praying for you, the Sunday school teacher, to respect them for what they're, what they're doing. Hallelujah. Pray for the man of God. Hallelujah. He's the one who's going to be praying for you. That was in the good old days, wasn't it? Christians back then lived this gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, back then they weren't a really a, what you'd call a real religious bunch of people. They were saved. Now there's a difference, isn't there? To be religious and to be saved. They had a relationship with God. They lived their life according to the commandments of this holy book back then. Yeah, they did. I remember my father-in-law saying that, hey, you know, I think it was him that said that, hey, when they got down to eat at the table, they, they, they said grace and they, nobody just got up when they wanted to. Everybody ate until everybody was finished. Then they got up. I believe it was you. Richard was telling me that. I mean, that's the way they did it back in the good old days, wasn't it? Had a, I, I seen a little sign there on vacation. It said, uh, it said the rules of the, the kitchen table. And um, I don't remember all the rules, but I do remember this one. It said no texting at the table. Oh, that's pretty good, man. I need to buy that one for my house. No texting at the table. I don't want to get caught on that. But back then, you know, back then, uh, they never thought twice. They were, they were always, the, the Christians back then were led by the Spirit of God. There's a difference. They were led by the Spirit of the Lord. They weren't led by what was on uh, the news or what was on television. They were led by what the Spirit of the Lord would have them to do. They never thought twice about going to the house of God when the church doors were opened. No, they didn't. They were there. And they clapped their hands way back then in the church house. They did. They raised their hand. Now, I know you all know that. They raised their hands when they prayed. They raised their hands when they prayed. I heard this one fellow, well, this, one, this one lady told me one time that she was in a, eh, I mean, I shouldn't say this. No, I'll say it. She said she was in a, uh, one of these uh, church, uh, church meetings, you know, the, uh, not the board meeting, but, you know, the membership meeting. And the uh, preacher was getting on him right hard and says, hey, you know, we need to come to church when the doors are open. And he was getting on him and he said, uh, he said, you know, we need to, you know, when you come to the house of God, you need to, you know, you need to be reading your Bible. You need to study the word of God. You need to pray when we have an altar call. <clears throat> and then he said, and it ain't going to hurt to clap your hands every once in a while. And she said, when he said that, some lady shot up in the air and pointed her finger at the preacher and said, well, we never had to clap them before. <laughs> and the preacher just looked at her. Isn't that sad we get to those, those days now? That we don't, we, we don't have that freedom in the house of the Lord. The devil shut us down, hasn't he? He has. He has. You know, they raised their hands back in the good old days when they worshiped the Lord. And they, when they felt the Spirit of God, when they felt them chill bumps come up, when they felt this sweet warmth of the sweet Spirit come up, they raised their hands and said, Thank you, Jesus. When the preacher said something or, or sister so-and-so, she sang a song and it touched your heart and you had that tear come down your eye. The devil didn't make you cry. It was the Spirit of the Lord. They raised their hands and said, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. When, the, when you felt like you got an answer that night, they, they said, Thank you, Jesus. They raised their hands and said, Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Back in those days, there was no seeker-sensitive churches back then. The focus of the church houses back then was on God and not people. It was on God. They preached and taught with the authority of this word. And it says that here in this 29th verse that Jesus did that. He said he taught them as one having authority. Back then in the good old days, those that were truly saved, they amen the preacher. They said, preach it, brother. It's tight, but it's right. 
How about shuck it on down and throw the cob to the devil? That's what they said. I've heard them say it. Pretty good, isn't it? Hey, they said that in Chicago. And they don't even have corn. If it is, it's in the can. But that isn't the way it is now, is it? No, it's not. The American church isn't necessarily like that now. No, it's not. I have often thought about these churches, these beautiful churches, and I have said this before, and I have used this illustration before, and I'll use it again tonight. The illustration of these, these beautiful churches that are all around us, that are all through Virginia. There are some in Chicago, some in the cities. These beautiful churches that have these graveyards around them. Some in the front, some in the side, some in the back. And I've, all, I've been to the funerals. Uh, sometimes they'll invite me to these. Well, I used to go. I don't do that no more being a pastor. They don't want you there now. <laughs> but anyways, that's another message in itself. But anyways, I've thought, you know, I've been to these churches. And I... And, and, and I thought that, that those laying in them graveyards from 100 and 100, and I've seen some old, I've been to these funerals and I've walked around and seen uh, some of these, uh, these old graves and seen the dates on them. You could barely read them. You know, some people, they'll take a piece of paper and a pencil and sort of and do them. I don't know if you all have ever done that. And, uh, but anyways, just see some of those old graves, those, those old dates. And I've often thought... If them people could get out of them graves, and I say this respectfully, if they can get out of them graves, and, and brother so, say Brother Jones, if he got up out of that grave and, on a Sunday and, and walked around that, out of that graveyard and walked into that front door and he sat down in that church, what would he think? What would he think? What would he say about what's going on in these churches? What would he say? Being in a cold, dead grave, would he see a cold, dead church? I'll tell you what he'd do. I can say it because I'm standing up here. He'd run on over to Sunshine Bible Church (laughs) where we're alive in the Spirit where they can feel this sweet Holy Ghost, this sweet spirit, where people are getting healed, where the Spirit of the Lord is touching hearts and touching lives, where you can feel it in the songs, you can feel it in the preacher, the preaching, and the preacher is alive and you never know what he's going to say. Hallelujah. Do you still love me? I love you. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where you can lift your voice and you can lift your hands. The Bible said where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is a freedom to where we can worship the Lord. We don't have to sit there with our hands crossed and our feet crossed. We can stand up and we can worship the Lord. We have that freedom in God. The devil is the one that would want us to not do that. Jesus said that if we didn't praise him, that the rocks would cry out in praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I'm telling you, I'm starting to... I'm starting to feel this again. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm speaking tonight on the title, The Chosen Few. They tell me right that all over this country right now that church houses are closing down in every state. They are. They're closing down daily. When I was growing up as a young child, I noticed and I believe that was part of the great Fallen away. It seemed like the attendance went down from when I was a child gradually to where we're at now. There in Chicago, I have been told there has been just great revivals and great movings of the Spirit of God before I was born. And they were hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand churches born throughout that city at one time because of of the revivals that they've had, but that ain't the way it is now. No, it ain't. You can turn on the news and see that. 
It's not like that. It's not a revival type of atmosphere now around us like it was. We are in a whole different mindset or thinking when it comes to the things of God now. It's not like the good old days, Brother Jerry. It's not like the good old days, Brother Bobby. It's not like it used to be. It's not. People don't value the things of God like their grandparents did. Jesus said it would be like that in these days. In 2 Timothy verse chapter 4, verse 2, the apostle Paul instructed the young preacher, Timothy. He said, Timothy, he said, preach the word, Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he says, Paul says to Timothy, he says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fables. Now fables... Fables are nothing but fancy stories and words that are not true. They're fables. Paul is saying here to Timothy, Timothy, reprove, rebuke. Don't let up, Timothy. Hold the faith. Lay it out there, Timothy, to my children. These are my children, Timothy. Lay it out to them. Tell them the truth. Because there's going to come a time they're only going to hear what they want to hear. Don't let up, Timothy. Truly today we are in a time where people is just like that. Itching ears. People want to hear the good words. Soft spoken words. Inclusive words. They want a different kind of gospel than what our Lord Jesus is preaching and teaching here in our scriptures. A different kind of gospel. There are pastors and preachers all around us that recognize that the people in the churches today are like that. There's pastors and preachers. They recognize that. They know how this generation is. They see how the people are. And what do they do? They try to please the people rather than please God. They do. Their focus now is trying to keep up the numbers to keep the churches opened. Get the numbers up, pastor. Any way they can increase the membership. We hear of all these different ideas now. I listen to these preachers. I listen to them. People will send me these links to them. I'll listen to them if I can, as long as they don't get too far out in left field. (laughs) I'll listen to them for a little while. You know, some now have this psychological, this psychology approach to to the gospel. They bring it from this, this mind type thing. Psychology. Everything is about the mind is what they'll do. The feel good thing. Some have this this new feel good way. We have now this purpose driven life kind of gospel that's being preached. Some are preaching and teaching this scientific new way which I have yet to figure that out. Everything's scientific. And there are many, many, many more ways that's being introduced every day, changing this gospel of Jesus Christ up. The Bible said that in these last days that people would listen to them, having itching ears, that they will listen to anything that makes them feel good. They will read anything that'll make them feel happy, feel good. 
If the preacher rings their doorbell, buddy, I'll tell you, they ain't bashful to tell you. They'll walk right out and go to another place. They don't want to hear nothing negative. They don't. A lot of times they'll smile right at you. Oh, for the good old days. For the good old days. When people had the love of Christ down in their heart, they had this love of God in their heart where they wanted to do right and they wanted to live right. They wanted to see people saved. They wanted to see the church succeed. They wanted to see the church grow, knowing that it was souls and hearts. When people were led by the Spirit of God in the good old days, I'm speaking tonight on the title, The Chosen Few. You know, I have listened to a number of these pastors and preachers in our time now. I listen to them. I am a, this is a non-denominational church. I am not motivated by a dollar, a cent. I am not motivated by a doctrine of some organization somewhere. I'm going to tell you something. I am led by the Spirit of God and this Holy Word. This Holy Word. And I tell you, my heart is for people. For people making it to heaven. Sister Shelby. Sister Early. My heart is for people making it. I'm not talking about just claiming to be saved. I'm talking about being saved to the day they die. And they go on. <laughs> when they go through those gates of pearl, hey, Brother Chapman, thank you for preaching it right. That's where my heart is. But I've listened to these preachers and these pastors nowadays. And there is one thing for sure, my brother and my sister, and I know you can amen me on this one. They have watered down the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? They have watered it down to appease the people. They have. They teach a different kind of gospel that Jesus taught. That he gave. They focus on the numbers now. They convey doctrines and ideas. Like uh, repeat after me and you're, you're saved. Just repeat it out. Poof. It's a legal document. Get baptized in water and you're instantly saved. Join our church and sign the paper. And you'll always be saved till the day you die. I've heard that. I heard a preacher say one time, that's the most damnable doctrine that's out there. I heard a man say one time, and I didn't mean to say this, but it come to me. They said that this man, this one preacher, was holding a revival. He was holding, maybe some of you have heard this. I'm, I'm new, and I, I just heard this not too long ago. And it shook me up. I was laying in the bed thinking about it. He said this man, this one good brother was in this church. It was a bigger church, and they was holding a revival all week long. And he said he was sitting in that church, and God gave him a vision. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you're full of the Spirit of God, the Lord will speak to you. God will give you a vision. He will. God has spoke to my heart many a time. And I'm going to tell you, he gave him a, God gave him a vision. And in this vision, it wasn't a dream. In this vision, he seen what he, he pictured as hell. And he seen in this picture, this vision of hell, these people moaning and yelling in this lake of fire. And he's seen this one hideous man in this fire. And he would walk so far and he'd reach down and he'd pick up a body that was screaming and he'd throw him back down. He'd go to another one, he'd pick him up and he'd look him in the face and he'd throw him back down. And the preacher told this told the Lord as he was sitting there, Lord, what do you mean? Who is this man? And what is he looking for? Who is he looking for? And he said that God told him that that man is looking for the preacher, the pastor that told him a lie. And he died lost. I thought, Lord... Lord, Lord, I want to be told the truth, don't you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. These preachers and pastors, I'm going to tell you, my brothers and my sisters, 
They're making the gate wider. They're making the road wider. They're making the gate wider. But Jesus told us a story here. These preachers and pastors, they deal out now this generic salvation that the Bible does not support. Sort of like joining a club now, a membership, as if you now are the one that saves yourself. Unlike our forefathers, these teachers and pastors of the days that we're in now, they teach a version of Christianity that allows you to live any way that you want. No changed life. You can sin a little weak, they'll tell you. Doesn't matter. You're always saved. The Ten Commandments, ah, we're in grace now. We don't have to live by the Ten Commandments. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not, Paul tells the Corinthians, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Well, this is pretty plain. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter what paper they signed. Doesn't matter what membership they joined. It doesn't matter. Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled, I just cut in on this story here. If you have a chance, read the first chapter of Romans. Paul said to the Romans, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Now, this is cutting it close here. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. And I'll stop right there. I have seen some of these billboards and some of these signs, and I have seen pictures of the hideous things for these movies I have ever seen in my life. And I'm like, who can even think of those things? Paul said, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Talking about sexual deviancy. Implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, Paul brings it down a little closer to us, but have pleasure in them that do them. I think of Fox at night, ABC at night, CBS at night. Have pleasure in those that, that commit fornication, that are, that are drunkards, that are murderers. I'm speaking tonight on the title, The Chosen Few. In our scriptures here tonight, to move this along, Jesus is warning his followers here. It is noteworthy that we, that we, identify who Jesus is talking to in our scriptures here tonight. He is talking to his disciples here. His disciples, the ones that are following him, the ones that are listening to the Lord. This is who he's talking to. He's not talking to the guy that don't believe him down the road. He's not talking about the people that are disagreeing with him. He's talking to the people that are following him, that are listening up. The believers, verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, Jesus said. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. Jesus is identifying that there are different ways that people try to go down to make it to heaven. 
He's identifying that here. He's saying that in an effort to get to heaven. But Jesus says there's only one way. And it's a narrow way. And he goes on and says the reason that that many people go down that way is because it's a strict way. It's a narrow way. It's a narrow way. And you have to find it. You have to find it. Verse 15. Verse 15, after he says here in 13 and 14, he says immediately he addresses something. He addresses the false prophets right after it. Call it a coinky dink if you want. But our Lord said it. He said, beware of false prophets, which in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree, listen to the word, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Notice here that Jesus is the one that will cut those trees down. The trees that have become corrupted. They're all trees. But some have become corrupted, like your hard drive becomes corrupted. It starts out working. It becomes corrupted, corrupted, and he will cast them into the lake of fire. Verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that, what? Doeth. Can we all say doeth? Do with the will of the Father, the Father which is in heaven. The world, now listen to me. Look at this, you can look at this verse, verse 21. The, the world, the people that are not saved are not going to call Jesus Lord, Lord. They're not going to call him Lord, Lord. They call them some other names. They use the name of Jesus in vain all the time. I hear them say bad words with them all the time. They're surely not going to call them Lord, Lord. They're not. Jesus is talking about people here that recognize him, that are considering him his Lord, their Lord. Jesus is foretelling of what people on the broad road is going to say to him on that great day. Verse 22 Jesus said, now he says, this is what's going to happen. He says that many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus said, will I profess unto them, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Iniquity being sin. You workers of sin, the people that Jesus is talking about here will address him as Lord, Lord one day. They're addressing him as Lord, Lord. They have prophesied in the name of Jesus. They have cast out devils in the name of Jesus. They have done many wonderful works in the name of Jesus. Have you ever prophesied? Have you ever cast out a devil? These people have here. The ones that are calling the Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, depart from me, you that work iniquity, that work sin. These followers are people that are living in sin, in iniquity. God calls many, but few are chosen. Sin separates us from God. No other way. We have got to keep the commandments of God if we are to make it through the straight, narrow gate. Isaiah 59 and 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, 
being sin, Isaiah said, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that ye will not hear. John chapter 15, verse 9. Jesus says to his disciples, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you com keep my commandments, now this is Jesus speaking, if ye keep my commandments, if ye keep my commandments, if ye keep my, not start my commandments, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Goes down to verse 13. Greater love hath, hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life, and our Lord did, for his friends. And he said, Ye are my friends if. The word if, right there in the King James Version, Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Our Lord said that. Jesus. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, in other words, if, we're, if the Lord's laying it down to us as Christians, if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the, the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the Lord's saying, hey, to us, you better, you better straighten up. You better enter at the straight gate. What, what about the people that are, are deep in sin, that have rejected Christ? What about them? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm about finished, Sister Rachel and Sister Monica, if you'd like to come up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In these last days that we are living, in the days of, and I borrow this term, Fake news. In these last days that we're living, in the days of this, of this new kind of gospel, this, this new fake news, there are literally tons and tons of so-called books of different ideas or ways that people have imagined in their own brain knockers. I don't know if that's a good word, brain knocker. It works. Thank you, brother. They imagine in their own mind, in their own way of thinking, that how everyone should live in Christianity. Go to the Christian bookstore. I've seen and heard things that is, I'll be honest with you, I think it's an abomination what they say. It's easy to get caught up in something that is not true, wanting the truth. It's easy. It's so easy to get caught up in that. It's one thing to believe yourself. Now listen to the preacher. I'm almost done. It's one thing to believe yourself in something that is not true. That is a line with God that I don't ever want to cross for my own self. But listen to the preacher tonight. When you teach... And I'll stand in judgment for this. When you teach and you preach a doctrine that is contrary to the words of our Lord and deceive people into believing something that they can sin and live a life that's contrary to the commandments of our God, His holy words, and that they can make it into heaven anyways, then you are crossing a line with God that I would never, ever, ever want to ever cross when I stand before Him. Revelation 22 and 18, and I'll close with this.
For I testify, now this is John the Revelator. You can read it in the book of Revelation. It's the last verses. It's the last verses beside, before the book of Maps. It's the last verses. Go home tonight and read it. Read it. Listen to the preacher. Listen to what John the Revelator said. This is good. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If man, any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And out of the... Take him out of the book of life. That goes against a lot of people's theology. Shall take a, shall take a, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In the last word, amen. There is only one gospel of Jesus Christ, my friend. There is only one Bible. Doesn't matter who believes it and who doesn't. It will never change. Never. Our God has given us this, this Bible, His Word, His precious Word. We are to read it. We're to learn it. We are to know the truth for ourselves. Study it. Write it on the fleshly tables of our heart. For truly one day, for one day, we'll be judged by it. We'll be judged by it. I sing, my sisters, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your sweet Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for the truth. Thank you, Lord, that we can, we can hear the truth tonight, that we can know your truth. Lord, that we can know your word. Lord, more than anything in my life, I've got to make heaven. You can have this world. They can have this world, Lord. Father, I want to be what you'd have me to be. I want to do what you'd want me to do. And I pray, Father, tonight, if there be one heart or one soul that would be living in sin, that don't know you, Father, that don't know your Son as their personal Savior, Father, would you give them the strength right now to walk down to this altar and to kneel down before you and repent of their sins. Father, I know by this word, your holy word, that it's not going to be much longer until you come and get your church. I pray, Father, would you make us all ready for that day. Hallelujah. Tonight, if you're not saved tonight, if you've never been saved, if you've never bowed down and repented for every one of your sins, I'm going to tell you, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. You can have that same peace. You can have that same peace tonight where you can lay your head on a pillow knowing that, Lord, if you take me in my sleep, I'm ready to go. If you take me going down the road in my car, I'm ready to go. Lord, let me have it just like that preacher up there that spoke it tonight. I want it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God loves you tonight. This preacher loves you. This church loves you. We want to see you make it. God wants you to be with him. Matter of fact, he's still got some, some room up there in some of those mansions waiting just for you, for those that want to be with him.